tiny country linking two vast continents. A tropical corridor between two great oceans. A people defined by nature. Oh, this is something amazing, guys. This is a glass frog. This is Costa Rica. Well, these are ridiculously cute. Hello. I'm Gaia Vince. I explore and write about our changing planet and what we humans can do to protect our natural world. This is why I'm not at home moaning about the state of the planet. You know, this gives me hope. I'm heading for a country that's made saving the planet a matter of national pride. I don't want to brag, but, I, but maybe I should. A national grid fueled by rivers and volcanoes. Go back to the river, my friend. Half a million different species. I mean, they're so ancient, they're like dinosaurs. The happiest, most sustainable country in the world. Gracias. This is the life. I'm packing my bags for Costa Rica. Pura vida. Head. Right, let's see if we can see some monkeys starting, all right? Keep your ears peeled and your eyes open. It's the middle of the dry season on Costa Rica's west coast, and Nick, Kip, Juno and I are beginning to feel right at home. Oh, that's very good, mate. Oh, my goodness. I think Daddy might be a little bit monkey, do you? <laughs> We're living in the small village of Nasara on the Pacific coast, and it really is a tropical paradise. Look, look, can you see the monkeys? Where are the monkeys, do you know? Can yeah, you see them? See them? Where? Yeah. There, that's right. Oh, wow. And look, look, there's two up here. Look at them eating the leaves. How am I There it is, yeah, that's, that's right. right. Oh, that's very good. And saying hello. Oh, you're saying hello. That's all right then. <laughs> I'll say bye bye, monkeys. Hey. Off we go. Costa Rica is the happiest, most sustainable nation in the world. 99% of its electricity comes from renewable energy alone. This is an incredible success story for a developing country. Even more remarkably, they have done all this while protecting huge swathes of their natural world. This is a country that has chosen to put more than a quarter of its land under conservation. and to derive almost all of its electricity from its volcanoes, from its rivers, from the rain. They're already thinking decades ahead. Mummy's off to do some more working. Right. Okay. Just getting rid of all the Pacific dust. I think that is a cleaner car anyway. <laughs> That's the Gulf of Nicoya next to us, so I truly left Nick and the kids now. I'm heading east. I'm travelling to the rivers and rainforests of the Cordillera Central, where the fate of two great rivers, the Rebentazon and the Pacuare, illustrate how Costa Rica has struck a balance between its need for energy 
and the needs of its natural environment. My first stop is the Pacuare River, one of the most pristine waterways in Costa Rica. While other rivers have been industrialized, the power of the Pacuare is harnessed in a very different way. <laughs> the Pacuare River is a bucket list destination for whitewater rafting. It's ecotourism with a huge adrenaline rush. Here we go, this is a good one coming up. Harder, 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 harder. Okay, relax, relax, thank you. Oh, wet bum! Excellent. That was an easy. Was the easy one? Yeah, it is an easy one. Okay, right. so just... I was really congratulating myself on surviving that. <laughs> so you've been doing this for how long? I grew up on this river, you know, like I was doing rafting since I was maybe seven. And all my brothers and sisters, we all grew up on this place. I love working here because when I'm working, I get the chance to see my mom. Albert's mom's house just happens to be located in one of the most remote, inaccessible parts of Costa Rica. There are no roads in or out. The only way to get there is a long trek through a very snaky jungle or down these rapids. Finally, out of the mist and spray, we arrive. <laughs> Turns out that Albert's mum's house might just be the most idyllic eco-lodge I've ever seen. It's breathtaking. 30 years ago, Albert's family had a farm here. Now, instead of growing crops, his mum manages the lodge. It must have been so different here before the rafting. Yes, it era muy diferente. Nosotros trabajábamos al campo para sembrar todo, para, para sobrevivir nosotros aquí con toda la familia. La sorpresa mía o de toda mi familia fue cuando vimos una balsa por este río Pacuari. Cuando vimos esa balsa, nosotros, uy, ¿qué es? Ya después fue pasando el tiempo y empezó esta compañía. Albert's parents sold their farm to the rafting company. His entire family now works for the rafting business. Ahora yo soy muy feliz vivir aquí, ver que llegan mis hijos a trabajar aquí. Para nosotros es algo muy lindo. What was Albert's family farm is now part of the largest private forestry reserve in the region. Visitors to the lodge have helped to plant over 28,000 new trees on the slopes of the gorge. People pay to come down here because it's so beautiful, because it's so untouched. And in a lot of ways, it really is the heart of Costa Rica's conundrum because this river that's gushing away really loudly, just down below me, could be used to make electricity. And in fact, it very nearly was. Thirty years ago, ISE, Costa Rica's power company, launched plans to build a hydro dam here to harness the river's huge energy potential. Protesters feared that damming the river would have flooded over 300 acres of this pristine valley. 
nosotros lo llamamos río Pacuarias, eso lo significa el río sagrado. Siempre los vivimos en la orilla, de esos son como los límites de nosotros, por nosotros y la gente de afuera. Y entonces por eso nosotros queremos proteger. Salatia Piaquero es uno de Costa Rica's indigenous cabacar, whose territory lies along the banks of this river. Living deep within the forest, the cabacar choose to have very little contact with the outside world. No queremos represas porque la gente se puede pasar en nuestros pueblos, en nuestras comunidades cerca, y entonces se perjudica más. Entonces haría muchas carreteras o troches, lo que, lo que no, no necesitamos, lo que no ha visto nunca. Y nosotros vamos a perdiendo también las costumbres y los todos. Lo que queremos es que respeten a nosotros, la gente de afuera. I want to find out more about how this river came to be protected. So I'm heading to the gorge, where a 25-year campaign to save the river first began. So this is Dos Montañas. This is where they must have planned to build the dam. I can see it's already made for them, pretty much. Exactly, exactly. Randall Solano, a rafting guide, took part in the very first protests against the dam. I remember in 1991, more than 100 people paddle upstream and spend two, three, four days here and everybody came down river and we did a dam of rafts and people protesting there, screaming, no dams, no dams, right on there. No represa. No represa, exactly. <laughs> Some people hanging on hammocks on the walls. No way, what, they were hanging? Exactly. Really? Yeah, really, yeah. Looks more yeah. terrifying than going down the rapids. Yeah. <laughs> the protesters fought the dam for two decades until in 2015, Costa Rica's President Solis signed a decree protecting the future of the Pacuare. It's a very special place. It's a very, special, very place. special place. Yeah, very yeah. special. Yeah. In Costa Rica, they're trying to strike a balance between developing their economy and protecting their natural world. This time, they chose conservation. But they still need to get their electricity from somewhere. I'm in central Costa Rica, exploring how this small country has become a world leader in the production of sustainable energy, while at the same time protecting millions of acres of its natural world. Costa Rica generates 99% of its national grid from renewable resources. I'm in the foothills of Costa Rica's Cordillera Central, in the province of Limón, just left the pristine, untapped Pacuare River, which is a really exciting series of rapids. And now I'm heading to the Reventazon River. They run very closely, just at the bottom of the Turrialba volcano. But this one has had a completely different ending. It's no longer running free. The Reventazon is the site of Costa Rica's latest hydro dam. The dam harnesses 118 million cubic meters of water, enough to provide electricity to a third of the population. Oh, wowzers. This is quite amazing. Water is released from the vast reservoir down through turbines to produce electricity. All right, let's go and see the reservoir. Eduardo Alvarado, the manager of the dam, has agreed to show me around. I get really excited when I see big mega dams. I mean, I'm still on the fence a bit as to whether or not I agree with big mega dam, but it's, right. there's something exhilarating, isn't there? It's just like <laughs> harnessing the power of a, of a river. Behind this wall, what used to be a fast flowing river is now a man-made lake containing 300 million cubic meters of water. The lake acts like a giant battery, storing up water in the rainy season to provide a steady supply of energy all year round. 
isn't this the biggest hydro dam in Costa Rica? This is actually the biggest power plant in uh, Central America. It's quite important for us. And probably this year, if the weather conditions are right, we are going to uh, maybe have 100% of our energy coming from renewable sources, <laughs> hopefully. That's uh, what Revenant is on this floor. It's an extraordinary achievement. But power on this scale doesn't come without a cost. Where did the original river flow? Where did it come from? Oh, it actually flowed uh, right in, in the middle of this. Was this a natural canyon before? Exactly. And we actually took advantage of the topographic conditions. It goes back almost 10 kilometers in length from here. It actually floated an area of eight square kilometers. It's quite a, a big amount of water. It's massive. It's... <laughs> yeah. and, and I mean, what it's flooded is essentially forest, isn't it? Yes. This forest provided a critical wildlife corridor between two of Costa Rica's highest mountain ranges. We actually moved 40,000 uh, animals to some protection places where we actually bought. So, Eduardo, uh, <laughs> how on earth did you move 40,000 wild animals? Well, it was, <laughs> it was a work, a non-stop work during that time. And are we talking like monkeys or are we talking jaguars? What, what, what uh, did you move? We had a, a few wild cats, monkeys, uh, almost everything. I mean, it's great to provide an area for them to, to go in, but I mean, it doesn't replace what was here before and it was so important. Yes, but we have to take from somewhere to give, in the end, something bigger. We could feed 525,000 homes from this very power plant. So that's actually something that I think uh, it's quite remarkable for, for Costa Rican okay. people. The rest of Central America and Latin America are betting still in coal and uh, fossil fuels. So, well, we have to balance it up. It's a compromise. It's a compromise. Rebentazon is the largest infrastructure project in Costa Rican history. Its scale is phenomenal. And by maximizing the power potential of this river, Costa Rica has been able to protect its sister river, the pristine Pacuare. Our global population is growing fast. There will be almost 10 billion of us by 2050. Providing sustainable power to that many people requires conscious, determined action. Costa Rica is already up and running. But this dynamic, developing country still has its problems. It's the approach to San Jose. Mucho trafico. The capital of Costa Rica, San Jose, is located at the centre of the country's volcanic spine. It's home to over a third of the population. It's not even rush hour yet and the traffic's already building. They're just clogged. <laughs> Costa Ricans now spend 15 days every year sitting in traffic. <laughs> Even though Costa Rica's doing so much right, it's this that's letting them down. Transport, it's all run on petrol, diesel. It's fossil fuel based. As a developing country, Costa Rica has its issues. But it's how it faces these challenges that's so inspiring. It has a pollution problem, so it taxes fossil fuels to invest in alternatives like wind and solar. It even harnesses the power of its volcanoes through geothermal. I want to know how Costa Rica manages such an ambitious agenda. So I'm off to meet President Luis Guillermo Solis. Something I think is really extraordinary is that Costa Rica has publicly said it is going to be carbon neutral by 2021, while it's still developing its economy. How's it going to do that? Some people feel 
that this is not going to be possible, and yet we're sticking to it because we feel very strongly that this is the way to go. We have been resisting suggestions that we should open up for petroleum exploration and mining. We have decided that this is not the way. We're not even exploring the country for natural gas. I mean, we are, have been almost 100% renewable in the production of electricity for two years. Yet we're very similar to other countries that have challenges, for example, in terms of our, our traffic, uh, the amount of cars that we have. And that's a huge challenge, and I grant you that. I mean, are there plans to try and get electric transportation? Oh yes, very much so. And the electric matrix is a significant part of the plan. But it's clear that we want the, the electricity uh, production to remain clean. So we're looking at other sources, for example, geothermal, solar, or air, trying to balance up the act. It does entail taking risks and, and sometimes swimming against the current. So companies want to they want to drill for oil, they want to drill for gas here, but you've made a conscious decision as a country. Oh yes, no, well, they can't. I mean, at this point, they would require a decree that I'm not willing to sign in order to abolish a decree that I signed, extending the decree of a previous president saying that they wouldn't be able to. This is not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen in my administration and it's probably unlikely to happen in the next administration, simply because it's not the way we want to go. You know, when I think about energy, I think about our human relationship with fire. You know, that's where we first got our energy from, and it's shaped us. Burning stuff is what allowed us to cook our food, and that changed our physiology, it changed our jaws, it changed, it made our minds bigger. It created the people that we are. And then burning fossil fuels, well, that's the most efficient way of making energy. So I think, it's extraordinary what Costa Rica's doing in transitioning to renewables. You know, to tap its rivers and its volcanoes and its wind and the sun. It's almost turning its back on our human history to do something better, deliberately. Too much oh, there. there yeah? they go. There they go. And they're going up their tunnel all the way, and that's where they live. That's oh. their house. Yeah. This is the old one. They've made all of this from chewing up wood. You can feel it. Very clever they are, even though they're tiny weenie. Those tiny they all little... live together in a big, big family, helping each other to build it. Oh, so there's another animal. Yeah, what's that? It looks, I don't know, maybe it's a new species and we can call it Kippus minimus. What do you think? Shall we do that? I'm back in the Sara, hanging out with Nick and the kids. They're turning into a couple of little adventurers. Yeah. What can you see? Chicken. We come all the way to Costa Rica and there's chickens. Chickens don't live in the forest, do they? No. People have brought them. What do the chickens do? They lay eggs. Exactly, and eggs are yummy, aren't they? Yeah. So, wherever people go, they bring their chickens and they bring their horses because they're useful. From where we get our food to where we get our energy, we humans have always had an incredible ability to tap the potential of our environment. We exploit our natural resources. That's what humans do. That's what humans have always done. We adapt to our environments. Every species does. And here in Costa Rica, they're taking that ability to adapt to a whole new level. In their quest to create power without adding to global climate change, Costa Ricans are harnessing one of nature's most destructive forces. 12% of the country's national grid is run on volcano power. Geothermal power involves drilling wells to extract hot water, often from hundreds of feet below the surface in volcanic zones. The steam from this is then used to generate electricity. There are nine potential geothermal sites in Costa Rica. Currently, they're generating power from just two of them. 
Costa Ricans want to expand their geothermal production. But just 90 minutes east of the capital, Costa Rica's most disruptive volcano is demonstrating just how ambitious harnessing energy in this way can be. Six thirty in the morning. I'm on the slopes of the most active volcano in Costa Rica. And there's signs of recent activity all over the place. Access to Mount Turrialba is strictly controlled and the local village of Central has been evacuated. Oh my goodness. Oh. Several centimetres of hash. It feels apocalyptic. Be careful, it might collapse. Looks quite close to it. I've been invited to join volcanologist Cyril Muller, who is on his way to his research base on the slopes of the volcano. Oh, wow! I can see the whole volcano now. Oh, my goodness. It's still smoking. These bursts of ash keep coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's quite impressive that when you have, like, rock or, like, hash like, falling. I can taste the acidity in my mouth. That's the sulphur, is it? Yeah, exactly. It uh, makes a lot of gas, but sulphur is dominating in, in this taste. And you can also smell it, right? And there's grittiness in my teeth. Oh, wow, look at that. Oh, yeah. And look at the gradient here. On the right is green, and on the left is completely grey and dead. This is the effect of this acidity. Oh, wow. Volcano fumes and rough terrain make for tough going. Oh my God. Yeah, it used to be a road here. And now it's, we're walking on the, on the lava flow. This is, this is lava from previous eruptions. Turrialba's latest eruptive cycle started last September. Its largest eruptions are producing columns of ash up to two and a half miles above the volcano. Cyril is part of a team of volcanologists based at the National University of Costa Rica who monitor active volcanoes and help predict when the next eruption might happen. We use an antenna here okay. and this antenna is actually uh, receiving uh, the satellite signal. This will follow the movement of the ground. So the ground here actually moves and you can record it? Yeah, exactly. The, when the magma intrudes beneath the, the volcano, it's just swollen like that. And we can pick that with a the, with the GPS. OK. So uh, this site last year uh, moved two centimetres toward this direction and two meters up. So That's it's typically... That's a massive movement. Massive. Yeah, yeah, you can. Imagine the power to, to just lift everything, all the mountain. <laughs> That's incredible. It's basically, basically, it's the earth belching, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the underground heat required for geothermal energy gets closer to the Earth's surface the nearer you get to a volcano. But the closer you get to the crater, the more unstable the environment becomes. And just a few hundred yards from Cyril's base, the raw, destructive power of an active volcano is laid bare. We are like in the heart of the most dangerous active volcano of Costa Rica. Nobody is allowed to come here. It could, uh, it could explode any time. Extraordinary. I mean, all I can see is death everywhere I look. I mean, a really hostile environment. These trees are, are dead. I mean, like before, it was all green. So the change is dramatic, dramatic. I mean, it just tells me how 
powerful our planet is because we don't really we're not often you know we're not often confronted really with the power of the earth suddenly the wind changes direction we're now right in the path of the ash cloud it's it's literally raining ash in my eyes they're really stinging so i i suggest uh, to, to move yeah to move uh, yeah. out of this zone As I'm leaving, I can't help feeling just a little bit proud. We humans have managed to harness the power of these natural bombs and turn them into the batteries that power our lives. Costa Rica's expertise is helping to develop new geothermal projects all over the world. These new power plants could supply more than 3% of the planet's electricity and 4% of the world's heat by 2050. My journey home takes me past the Guanacaste mountain range, a string of volcanoes in the north of Costa Rica, where the country's main geothermal plants are based. What an incredible view. It's like a child's drawing. <laughs> I'm still covered in ash from Turrialba, but I know a fantastically volcanic way to get rid of it. I just need to find the spot. Hola, buenas. Está frío acá. Es normal. Normal. Sí. Ah, sí. Fresco. Fresco. Hay un río caliente cerca de aquí. Sí, hay un río que es de agua termal. 10 kilómetros al este y hay un descenso para llegar al río y es, ah, sí. es gratis. Ah, oh, muy bien. Es agua me gustó. Me... Estoy buscando eso. Te lo recomiendo. Sí, claro. muchas gracias. Pura vida. Pura vida a, tu, a ti. I met a guy there who told me that there is a river which comes directly from the volcano and it's hot. And get into the river and swim in it. Is this the bridge? I think it might be. Just seen some people coming out of here, so I'm gonna explore. <laughs> nice! I'm gonna have my first Costa Rican bar. After emerging from a string of underwater volcanoes, three million years ago, Costa Rica became part of a bridge connecting North and South America. This natural barrier rerouted the ocean current and transformed our planet, cooling the Arctic and creating the savannas of Africa, leading to the evolution of the human race. For a small country, Costa Rica has always packed quite a powerful punch. Come on, we're going to pack up some stuff, darling. We're going on our holiday, aren't we? Yeah. I'm going to promise you too. Yes, you are. I've been exploring Costa Rica's pioneering use of sustainable energy. And tomorrow, I'm going to join one of the most unusual projects I've ever heard of. But first, it's time for some family time. I cannot wait. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. We've come to Playa Hermosa, just up the coast from our house in Nasara. It's one of the best dive spots in this part of the country. I am absolutely looking forward to this. It's going to be completely amazing.
country has almost a thousand miles of coastline. And over half of that is protected. Dive tourism is big business here, and Costa Rica sees this part of the country as the perfect place to develop this strand of ecotourism. Humans couldn't exist without the oceans. They provide half our oxygen and absorb more than a quarter of our carbon emissions. But right now, they're really struggling. All our carbon is making the oceans warmer and more acidic, and it's getting harder for marine life like coral to survive. In Costa Rica, they're feeling the effects as much as anywhere. But it's the way that Costa Ricans are responding that's unique. Protecting the planet is a matter of national pride here. It feels like everyone gets involved. Just around the corner from where we're staying, a team from ISE, Costa Rica's power company, Hola. are preparing for one of the most unlikely recycling projects I've ever heard of. Oh, wow. So many of them. Estos son parte de los que hemos retirado de la red. Entonces, la porcelana sí. tiene la posibilidad de ser reciclada. Pero esta pieza metálica mm. nos limita esa, esa opción. Oh, I see. When engineer Walter Arias was upgrading Costa Rica's electricity grid, he was left with thousands of porcelain insulators to dispose of. When he saw how the damp climate of Costa Rica's forested areas had affected them, he had an idea. El esmalte, ellos lo van perdiendo. Y de alguna forma se generan un poco más poroso. Encontramos algunos que tenían adherencia de musgo. Y ahí es donde nace el proyecto. Walter heard about a local project trying to build artificial reefs for marine life. Realising that his insulators were already supporting plant life above ground, he saw no reason why they couldn't do the same underwater. So today, we're using pieces of a defunct national grid to build a new home for fish. We are hoping that the same thing happens in the, in the sea. So instead of moss, it will be some sort of algae, perhaps even coral, and that the fish will <laughs> establish themselves on it. Sí, basicamente, está asociado a formar una estructura de seis puntas que nos permita poder jugar como un Lego. Yeah, I'll hold it still. Es, eso significa que nos va a permitir poner uno, otro y otro. Are you going to come diving down to put them in place? Eh, no, yo sobre el bote no, no sé bucear. No? No. You can't dive? You came up with this master plan and you can't even dive? Solo me lo he imaginado, lo que quiero tener. You must learn so that you can see your underwater city when it's made. Sí, oh. pero es mi nuevo proyecto. Sí. Muy pesado. With our Lego pieces assembled, the hard work really begins. Ooh. Okay, let's go. We're going to load these stars up and we're going to find the right place and we're going to lower them all down. Then we're going to get kitted up, dive in and construct some sort of architecture. <laughs> we can try and recreate what a reef does naturally with an experiment. It's brilliant. Hola, con mucho gusto. And this reef won't just benefit the fish. Walter hopes it will create a new, low-impact dive attraction for tourists. Which would ease pressure on the more vulnerable marine sites nearby. You want to try it? Yeah. False knot. False knot, OK. Yeah. You have to tie it tight enough, but easy enough to untie it from up here. Let's see. And then this one through here. Yep. And then pull with this That's one. That's it. Listo. Listo. <laughs> the dream's coming together, yeah? Una, dos, 
How far down is it? Eight meters. More or less. More or less. Yeah. Walter's team have conducted tests to make sure the insulators won't contaminate the ocean as they degrade. Have we gone all the way down yet? Is it on the bottom? Yep. OK, so now we have to release the rope. Oh, well done. OK. Listo. OK. Can okay. you see? OK. One, two, three. Feels a bit odd putting these insulators that are clearly from a power station to the bottom of the sea. It feels almost like we're trashing the ocean, but, but of course we're doing the opposite. We're trying to generate new growth. This is genius. This is not sitting at home crying over there being no coral reefs. This is trying to come up with an alternative. You know, maybe coral will grow on it, maybe it won't, but it's going to be a great place for fish to hang out, and that's the start. Hey, Walter. Yeah, we already done four. Muy bien. With the pieces all lowered in, it's time to start building. Okay, I'm going to go down and see those structures myself. I'm going to build a city for fish. <laughs> okay. Walter's team only began work on this structure a few weeks ago, and they have a lot more blocks to add before it's finished. But I see that plants are already starting to grow and plenty of fish are coming to check out their new home. Ha! Oh, that was amazing! <laughs> I mean, it's simple. It's just some blocks on each other, but it's amazing how effective just a simple structure can be. It's not a coral reef, but it's pretty good. I can't wait to tell Walter how well his idea is working. Well, that was amazing for me to actually see it all happening. And let me tell you, there are fish already living in your artificial construct. Yo estoy más feliz que usted, creo porque 97% de nuestros arrecifes tienen un grado de afectación y tendríamos la oportunidad de colaborar dándole vida con un desecho que para nosotros ya no tenía ninguna solución. Aislamiento eléctrico hay en todo el mundo y la posibilidad de utilizarlo en otras partes y en otras latitudes será posible. La expectativa es que haya un ecosistema que ayuda a la comunidad, que ayuda al país y con toda la esperanza que llegue a ayudar al mundo. People across the world are trying all sorts of things to breathe new life into our threatened oceans. But this is the first time I've heard of a power company using bits of its old national grid. It's experimental stuff, but that's what we humans are good at. And here, in Playa Hermosa, the signs are good. If it works, Walter's team predicts that this reef could advance the development of the ecosystem here by more than a hundred years. I'll tell you what I like about Walter. He had a crazy idea to build an underwater reef out of old porcelain insulators. You know, he didn't see, like so many of us, just see these huge global problems and think, I can't do anything. He just had the idea, he went out and did something, and that's somewhere for fish to go, it's somewhere for marine life to grow. And it's something for this community, you know, whose tourism, the whole tourism industry here depends on people having something to look for in the ocean. And, you know, if it works here, why can't we try it elsewhere? As our planet gets warmer, we're going to have to find more ways to support our vulnerable oceans. And that's what I love about Costa Rica. It's full of people determined to find answers to the difficult questions we face. But some questions will always be tricky to answer. Mummy, how did you make me in your tummy? 
<laughs> There's a loaded question. How did I make you? You grew there from a special egg, darling, in Mummy's tummy. Like turtles. Just like turtles. That's right, sweetheart. Well, Mummy didn't bury you in a beach and leave you for a month. <laughs> Next time, I explore one of the most spectacular events in the natural world. It started! You're yeah. telling me this has yeah. finally started? When thousands of Olive Ridley turtles arrive on Ostianel Beach to lay their eggs. I hit the dance floor with a donkey, the Virgin Mary and the oldest people in the world. And I travel deep into the rainforest to visit the indigenous Bribri who are using ecotourism to rediscover their traditional way of life. Turns out I'm a writer, not a reefer. <laughs>